Hello everybody, and in this video I will be introducing you to MARS, which is an IDE specifically used for assembly language programming in MIPS. You may search MARS MIPS Simulator in your search engine or directly go to the website from the link in your Lab 1 PDF to download it. And once you reach this landing page, we're going to go to the download section of the website and start downloading MARS at this, with this green button at the top. And at the bottom, it says that Mars requires a certain version of Java installed on your computer. If you know that you need this version of Java on your computer or are unsure, I recommend that you go to download Java, JDK download, and get the appropriate version for your OS. Usually when students have problems trying to launch Mars for the first time, this would be the first place to look because if you don't have this version on the computer for your, um, for this jar file, it's not going to even run, so something to keep in mind if you're trying to troubleshoot for your first lab. Alright, and I'm going to launch Mars from my desktop. If, as you saw before, I moved the Mars file from my downloads to my desktop in order to launch it. And I'm going to open up some example code for us to run through. Hello world, of course. And when you see your first, when you see your first MIPS code file, definitely do not be intimidated by it when you first open it up. The labs are built on top of skeleton code, so you won't be expected to build the file every time. It's more about working with what data is given to you and understanding how how to accomplish certain things as described in your lab PDFs. All right, so if we look at it, main, main will be where the program actually starts and data is where you can declare your data, of course, things like strings or how much memory you want to set aside for certain variable, etc. Down below here, is the Mars messages window, which will print out messages from the IDE telling you if your program assembled correctly, which is a great thing because that means there are no code breaking errors. And it will also tell you if there's a, it will tell you which line there's an error with. And you can also make sure you turn on your line numbers when you do that too. Under the run IO tab, you can receive input from the user and see what gets printed from the syscalls as an output among other things such as terminating an execution for your program right here. On the right, we'll see the registers which are quickly accessed by the simulated processor and its values are linked to specific memory addresses on the right under value. There's different roles for the registers as convention that we'll learn more in depth about in the near future. But as you can see, up to this register, everything's empty as of right now. And when you're looking at your first file, you might be thinking, what am I looking at right now? What are these lines doing? Sometimes there'll be comments about what's going on, but you gotta understand how to figure things out for yourself. So that's why this help button at the top, this question mark, is going to be your best friend. Under the basic instructions, you can see some things, some information about what the different commands are doing, and these are standalone commands. The difference between basic instructions and pseudo instructions is that pseudo instructions simplify some of the processes like loading addresses, for example, I believe. LA. Right. It will it will take common common commands and just bring it down to one. And when you assemble it, you can see it actually break down. But that's the difference between the two. There's more than one instructions involved in a pseudo instruction. And then with basic instructions, you might have homework problems or maybe, I don't, I'm not sure about the lab, but there's definitely some homework where you won't be expected to use any pseudo instructions. You have to actually know how you can get to the answer that the pseudo instruction is using. Under syscalls, which I mentioned when I was explaining run IO, 
you have some steps on how to use a sys call system service. You have to load the service number into this register v0, and if there's any arguments, such as this syscall is actually going to print the string that is attached to this label, and when you call syscall, it will print the value at a0. And here, this service number 10 is being loaded into v0, and it's going to actually terminate the code. Exit, terminate, execution. All right, you can definitely explore more of that yourself, or if you ever need more reference, I always recommend you to look at your textbook or go on the internet to find more information. There are some great videos on YouTube for you to watch and get a better understanding of how MIPS works. So I'm going to go to the top of the window, and as you can see, there's this little tool icon which is responsible for assembling your program. You can choose to completely run the program, well granted that it completely assembles everything in the op as we can see in Mars messages, assemble operation completed successfully. That means everything is all good. You can completely run it by using this main green play button right here. You can go back to the beginning of the program by doing this reverse button. A very useful thing is setting a breakpoint and it's going to stop at the line you set it at but not actually perform whatever the line was until you go past it. So when I press play, it's going to stop at the syscall for printing a string. And then when I go past it, it's going to actually finally print welcome to CSC 3666. When you go backwards, you can of course use this reset button or undo the last step using this blue button right over here. And something else to note is that you can't reverse back to a breakpoint. Breakpoints are pretty useful when you have a loop in your function and you want to see how the values are changing every iteration. In the data segment window, we can see the address at which we stored our string and then these are offsets. You can toggle whether or not you want to see hexadecimal or decimal. And if I check ASCII, I can actually see the letters themselves. And it's pretty interesting. They're stored backwards and you'll definitely learn more about why that is. And then under source, of course, you can see these are the lines from our function and then they're slowly being translated into the 32-bit instructions that will be stored at the memory just for the simulator's memory. And that mainly covers everything that you'll be working with when you're trying to code in MIPS. So I hope this video was very helpful for you and cleared things up for your first lab.